Hi everybody, it's Leah with Family Heritage Living. I was reading an article today and I thought I would go ahead and share it with you folks. It was concerning a time in Montana and it's titled Montana in 1910. I was seven years old when I arrived in Shelby, Montana with my mother and older sister that long ago February in 1910. The train was filled with other Minnesotians but all bent on being among the first to file on homestead and thus acquire some free land the government was offering to attract people to the west. My dad and older brother had preceded us with four horses, six cows, and farm machinery. Our final destination was Conrad, Montana, another lively homestead town about 25 miles south of Shelby. There was only one drawback. No train was going south until the next day. We soon found there was no accommodations for anyone to stay overnight. So all of us ended up crowding into the waiting room at the depot and felt fortunate to find a warm place to sit. Conditions were better the next day when we arrived in Conrad to find my father had already bought a house and barn. My folks soon found out it took quite a sum of money even to claim free land. So while my father and brother prepared to work the land, my mother decided to do the one thing she really was trained to do. She rented a restaurant and rooming house called the Farmer's House Hotel. She rented out the seven upstairs rooms by the week. The tenants took care of their own rooms. All my mother did was furnish clean sheets and towels once a week. She wasn't worried about poorly kept rooms because they were so much in demand. One unkept room and the renter was out. There was a lobby downstairs where the guests of the hotel could sit around the warm stove in the evening and play cards or just visit. The sleeping rooms derived their heat from the stove in the upstairs hall and what heat traveled up the stairs from the lobby. Everyone locked, left their door open. The dining room contained three long tables, each accommodating 10 or 12 people. Meals were served family style. By that, I mean the tables were set after everyone sat down. The food was all put on the table at once and passed around as it would be in any home. My mother always cooked breakfast while my sister waited on tables. The other two meals were prepared by a Filipino cook. Some people in town owned their own milk cow. Many of those who didn't bought milk from us as we had more than was needed in the restaurant. It was my job to pull a small wagon containing a 10 gallon can of milk around to all the customers we could find and sell it for 10 cents a quart. I had a quart measure which I would dip in to the can and then pour milk into a container provided by the person buying the milk. I furnished milk to all individuals who wanted it, then took in all the saloons. The saloons were in a row on the west side of the track facing the railroad track and stretched out one month after another for a block or so, about seven or eight of them. Milk was also in demand by the men on the section crew. These men were the ones who kept a portion of section on the railroad tracks prepared so the train could pass over them safely. Out on the edge of town, on the east side of the railroad tracks were three large two-story frame houses. These places housed about seven or eight girls each, and it was called the Red Light District. I especially liked to deliver milk there because the girls always bought milk and always paid me double. An extra 10 cents for each quart of milk was quite a bonus. When my brother had time, he hauled water from the creek called the Dry Fork, which was six to eight miles north of the Conrad. He hauled eight barrels in a wagon, which was pulled by a team of horses. He sold the water for a dollar a barrel. To get back to the saloons, early Saturday night, the cowboys from the surrounding ranch ranches came galloping into town on their ponies to party and get drunk and have an occasional fight. All their week's pay was gone by early Sunday morning, and it was time to go back to their respective ranches again, punching cows until the next Saturday night with the next week's pay in their pockets just waiting to be spent. During this time, their horses had been tied to the hitch ra hitching rails in front of the saloon. By three or four in the morning, the cowboys still felt too good to mount their horses and leave quietly. So they mounted them with a whoop and a holler, fired their six shooters in the air, and galloped up and down the boardwalk in front of the saloons. Finally, they would leave their richer but sadder saloon keepers, would go out and get as many as two to six planks as they needed to replace the broken ones in their walk. Each saloon keeper kept a pile of these planks stacked beside the, his place of business to take care of the constant repairs which were required. Of course, I was going to school all this time. The schoolhouse was a four-room cement building and two grades were taught in each room. The kids always wanted me to play with them after school. Since I had work to do every evening, I was never free to play. And as a result, the town bullies took turns beating up on me as often as they could while I was returning home from school. This was observed for some time by an elderly gentleman by the name of Hagen, who worked in the livery stable. He lived in our hotel and ate at our restaurant. 
He always liked me, and one day after a beating, he called me into his office and said, Look here, son, you have to learn to defend yourself. I'm going to teach you something about fighting. He proceeded to do that, just that, and after six or seven lessons, I felt I could take care of myself. The next time one of these bullies jumped me, I really surprised him, giving him the licking of his life. And after about three such episodes, all the boys were my friends, and there were no more fights. I will never forget old Mr. Hagen. My brother's pride and joy was a big black Newfoundland dog called Carlo. Carlo liked to ride the wagon, so when my dad took a load of lumber out to the homestead to build a shack, Carlo rode along. Since it was too far to make the trip in one day and also set up a tent for a temporary shelter, he stopped overnight at a sheep camp within 12 miles of his destination. The next morning, Carlo was missing. Thinking he'd gone back to town, Dad was unconcerned and went on to build the shack. When that was completed, he returned to town to find that Carlo wasn't home. Over the course of the next few months, we looked for him and made many inquiries. Finally, after we'd given up ever seeing him again, a man came to Conrad who got caught into a storm, so stayed in town overnight at our hotel. In the course of his conversation to my dad, he just happened to mention that he had the most wonderful dog he'd ever seen at his farm. We found out that a few months before this, Mr. Hill had been hauling water from a reservoir a few miles from his homestead. He always carried a gun along with him to shoot coyotes. He saw this big black animal, which looked like a bear, coming toward him, so he shot at him and just grazed him. When the animal fell down, he started crawling towards the wagon, whining and begging. At once, Mr. Hill said he knew this was a dog. When the dog reached the wagon, he wanted to get on it, so Mr. Hill helped the dog on the water tank and took him home. There he was treated for his wound and was soon well again. Since his son and daughter had become very fond of this dog, which weighed about 300 pounds and had thick black curly hair like a sheep, from this description of the dog, my dad immediately knew it was Carlo. My brother was delighted to find that his beloved dog was alive and well and asked that Mr. Hill to give Carlo back him again. Finally, Mr. Hill said if my brother could find him another dog as good as Carlo, he would be willing to trade. Now, I had a fox terrier, which was my pride and joy. He followed me to school in the morning, waited for me, and then returned home with me every day. I had even trained him to transport me all over town on a sled by just taking the other end of the rope, which was fastened on the sled with his teeth and pulling. In other words, Teddy was my constant companion. After much discussion, my folks finally decided that Teddy should be traded for Carlo. That about broke my heart. But the dogs were traded, and my brother got his wish, as most older brothers managed to do. Not long after that, we moved out to the homestead, and a brand new way of life opened to me. And that was that. <laughs> it's kind of a sad story in the end. Um, yeah. I guess I have nothing to say about that. I just, you know, we're we're animal people and our dogs, each of us had or have have had or have a special dog and it would just break someone's heart to have to exchange it for the other. Um, as you can hear, RJ's dog snoring in the background. So, an anyway, interesting story. Uh, the red light district, the saloon, that came as a little bit of a shock when I was reading it. Um, but those were, you know, that's reality. That was reality for a lot of people that were uh, immigrating. We'll use the word immigrating from the east to the west. And once you're there, you're kind of stuck. They had to make a living. And that was, uh, apparently, they had to be in that area until their homestead was built. So, very interesting. But if you all have any comments or you have any stories you'd like to share, please do so down in the section, in the comment section below. And until next time, we will talk soon. God bless.